Today we're going to start looking at a little bit more with logic, uh, but changing gears. So chapter two was about set theory and how it related to logic, especially those Venn diagrams at the end. Um, we're going to be looking at logic um, in this section as well. Again, there's some overlap with this and a couple other classes that you might have been exposed to before. Um, some elementary ed stuff um, for those of you who have taken some of those math courses. Uh, potentially critical thinking as well um, delves into a little bit of what we're looking at. So the first thing we're going to be looking at today is a little bit of definitions. Um, so a statement is a declarative sentence that is either true or false. Uh, an example of something that is a statement would be this. I ate cereal for breakfast. It's either true or it's false, okay? Um, there's several ways that you could create a sentence that is not a statement. Um, one way, one way that's not going to be discussed um, in a little bit here um, is uh, that it says I. I ate cereal for breakfast. Um, so there's an example that shows up sometimes that will say something like, she ate cereal for breakfast. And that's not an example of a statement because we don't know who she is, right? Is she Amberly? Is she Emma? Is she Kendallin? I don't know who she is. And if I don't know who she is, I can't decide if the statement's true or false. Does that make sense? So that's one caveat to something that can happen. The other two um, that are more prevalent, that come up quite frequently, are questions. What did you eat for breakfast? That's not a statement. Uh, or commands like, eat your breakfast. Right? Like that's not a statement either because it doesn't have a true or false, um, you don't have the ability to assign true or falseness to it. So I've got two examples for you. I'd like for you to read through them and write down what you believe to be the correct answer are these statements. So it's either a statement or it's not a statement. So go ahead and jot those down and then we'll make sure that everybody has the correct answers. Yep, number one and number two, you're just deciding is it a statement, right? The directions just say decide if it's a statement or not a statement. Hmm. All right, so what do you think? Is the first one, number one, yield to oncoming traffic, is that a statement? No. So why not? It's a command. Yeah, it's a command. So this one fails because it's a command. How about the second one? Yes. One gallon of milk weighs more than four pounds. Yeah, that's a statement. And whether or not you know whether it's true or false, you could figure it out, right? Like you could Google this or you could go and um, you could actually weigh it yourself if you needed to do it empirically or something like that. We can figure out if this is true or false. Uh, we don't have to know it right now in order to be able to say that it's a statement. Good? All right, so the next thing that we're going to take a look at is combining statements together. So a compound statement is a statement that is formed by combining two or more statements. And in particular, the way that we combine statements is with connectives. Um, connectives are words like and, or, but, uh, not, if then, so there's really just three statement connectives that show up, and everything else can be boiled into one of the others. So and, or, and if then. Uh, the word but, it really just means and. So if you said something like, today is Valentine's Day, but we're still in school. Well, the but right there gives sort of English context, but it, if we put the word and, it would mean the same thing. Today is Valentine's Day and we're still in school, right? It conveys some sort of an emotion or something like that, but it, it doesn't actually change the fact that it's just an and statement. So if you see the word and, sometimes if you see the word um, not, it will be like that as well. 
The word not also has um, another usage that we're going to see that's a little bit different. Um, it doesn't have to occur between statements as a connective. It can actually occur in front of a single statement as well, which is usually how we see it used. So the three that are really the compound statements we're going to spend our time on are and, or, and if then. Okay? So we're going to decide, looking at the next two statements, same as you did for the first two, but you're not going to decide if it's a statement. You're going to decide if it is a compound statement. Okay, is it compound? Go ahead and read through those, jot down what you believe to be the answer, and then again, we'll check and make sure everybody has the right idea. So what do you think on the first one? If Tom is a politician, then Jack is a crook. Is that a compound statement? Yes. Yes. Uh, what's the connective being used? Yeah. yeah. And what we're looking for when we're looking for compound statements, like deciding if it is, is if there's two statements that is sort of stand alone, you know, two different independent thoughts, right? Tom is a politician, Jack is a crook, and then they're combined in some way. And this one happens to be combined, like you guys said, with an if-then connective. How about tomorrow is Wednesday? No, that's not a compound statement, right? There's no connective with two separate statements between them. This is not compound. It is a statement though, right? It's a statement that if we reference today would actually be a false statement, but it's a statement. Okay, any uh, questions about those ideas? Okay. Um, I mentioned this word not. It's circled on our screen right now. That word not actually comes into play, like I mentioned, in a slightly different fashion, and that is with something called negations. So a negation is the logical opposite of a statement. So sometimes that's very clean and easy and direct. So we're going to start with one of those. We're going to take the statement that I used earlier, which was, I ate cereal for breakfast. What would you say is the negation, the logical opposite of that statement? I did not eat cereal for breakfast. Exactly. Does that make sense? It's pretty direct, right? We just say the same statement with the word not somewhere in there is usually how that works out. Uh, and it works really well for simple statements like this. So why do I call it a simple statement? Well, I call it a simple statement because it doesn't have what's coming next. The statement that I just used doesn't have things called quantifiers. All right, so quantifiers describe sort of how many um, objects it applies to. I, I know I is one, and that, that sort of describes how many. But we're looking for these specific words. Words like all, each, every, no, and none. Those are called universal quantifiers. They specify that it's true for everything, right? It's an all-encompassing statement. It's universal. Right, so a universal statement would probably be something like, everyone believes that murder is awful. It's a sin. It's bad. Right? Everyone believes that. Right, so something that's talking about everyone um, in some fashion using any of those languages called universal quantifier. And then we've got the other ones. Uh, the other ones are called existential quantifiers. So these are words that mirror like some or there exists, or for at least one. So it specifies that there's a collection of people or objects or whatever that satisfy this criteria, but maybe it's not everything. Maybe it's not everyone, right? So some people in this class are female, right? And sort of inherent in the way that you say it, it, it makes it sound like, well, probably some are not. Now, it doesn't say that. It doesn't have to be that that's to the but that it lends itself to that option, right? 
it leaves room for that to be the case. So this is the existence of something happening, not necessarily that it always happens this way. And the caveat and why these kind of go hand in hand is that negations with quantifiers are not quite as easy as negations without them. So the negation for the statement I ate cereal for breakfast was really easy. We just put the word not in and we were done. But let me take my example of everyone, oh, we'll just use it very clearly, it says everyone believes that murder is wrong. What does it take for that to be false? One person. One person. It takes exactly one person who says, I don't believe that. Right? So when I'm looking at creating a negation here, what happens is that if I have these statements that are universal, like everyone, every, all, you know, those kind of statements, and I want to do negation, they become the ones that are in red. There's at least one person who thinks that murder is okay, or at least that it's not wrong, right? That would be the negation of that statement. I don't need everyone to change their mind. I just need one person to prove that statement is false, one person. So when we're working with negations between, uh, with quantifiers, we're going between quantifiers um, so if we have an existential, it will become universal. And if we have a universal quantifier, it will become an existential. So the first example, or the example that we're going to do, there's two of them, but with language, um, is number five. It says some books are longer than this book. What is the quantifier in this statement? Some. The word sum here is a quantifier, and I happen to have highlighted it in red, which is kind of providential, because what kind of quantifier is it? It's an existential. It's an existential, the ones I highlighted with red over here. That's an existential quantifier. So what that means is that I would need to change it into a universal quantifier next in order to create the negation. And you can generally change it either way, but one of them seems more natural than the other one. For example, we can change it into, from some into no or none or into all. No books or all books. I mean, those are our two options. Yep, Isabel. So if we were in my math lab and there was like those two options or if we just typed it in or something, would one of them be wrong? Does it let us use both? They tend to use multiple choice for these because they don't like you typing things in that then it has to edit. Because if you typo, it automatically makes things wrong. Um, so they generally will take these and they'll give you like four statements and you have to pick which one's right. Um, but they wouldn't give you both of the statements I'm about to be giving you as options. One or the other would be there. So your red flag that you're looking for is for changing the existential into universal and then what comes next. Okay. So on this one, it's either no books or all books. And... As we write them, one of them is going to be like, oh, yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. And the other one going to be like, well, that sounds a little bit funny. And technically, it's correct. It's just not how we usually speak English. That's how it ends up working out. So the one that's going to be the most commonly spoken English is probably going to be the one that my math lab is going to give you as one of your four options anyway. So I've written two options. We've either got no books or all books. So my original statement said some books are longer than this book. If I go to no books, what would come next? Yeah, no books are longer than this book. And that one is the natural feeling one. No books are longer than this book, right? Some books were, now no books are. Is it? It's saying just some. It's saying some books are longer than this book. Right. So we're we're creating the negation, okay. the logical opposite. Okay. So right, we're not we're not rewriting it into an equivalent statement. We're changing the statement into the opposite. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. You bet. So no books are longer than this book, right? If some books are, then the opposite of that would be that no books are. How could I rewrite all books? So that it would work. Because I can't just say all books are longer than this book. That's not a negation. That would be a stronger statement than I already have. Right? So what could I do? All books are not. Mm -hmm. All books 
are not longer. than this book. It technically meets the criteria. It works, but that's not how we usually think about English. Like it's not, it's not naturally flowing for us to make that statement. All books are not. That feels weird, right? All books are not, well, why don't we just say none of Mar? Well, we do in the other statement, but both of them are actually negations for this. Isabella. So would all books are longer than this book be wrong? It would. Um, all books are longer than this book is not a negation. It's a statement that's stronger than what I had before. Right? So, like, let's take this class as an example again. So if I said some of my class, some of this class are, are females, all right? And then um, one day, um, you know, the guys didn't show up, right? And so it was just really all females that day. Well, now all of the students are females is not different than the, it, I shouldn't say different, it's not the negation of the first statement, it's just a stronger statement now. Now we're not just saying some, we're saying everyone, right? It's just a stronger statement to the positive, it doesn't change the meaning to the negation of it. Okay? So we're, when we're working with um, quantifiers, we have to change some to all or none, and if we had the all or none, we'd have to change it into some, or there exists, or one of those. Okay, they have to flip and then you have to have the opposite statement than what's there, not a stronger statement. And, and it is common for students to want to pick the stronger statement because it sort of satisfies part of the criteria, but not all of it. Uh, the next example is one where it involves uh, an inequality. So it wants us to give the negation of the inequality, but to not use the slash symbol. So chances are that's not what you would have thought to do anyway, but it's eliminating the possibility for, for someone who would have. Uh, so the slash symbol, just so that your reference, you got the right idea, is when people put a line through, you know, like equals, not equals, like that, that slash symbol, that's what it's saying don't use. So it doesn't want you to do that. Don't, don't do that, okay? So, because technically when you put a slash through, it means the word not. So you technically correct. So, this statement says x is greater than or equal to 5. So what would the negation of that be? Yeah, you do reverse it, so instead of greater than, it's less than. But you also don't include the equals, right? You don't include the equals. So when you're taking these inequalities, one of them is going to include equals and the other one's not. So if they had started out the example saying uh, x is greater than 2, I'll just change it, then our negation would not just say x is less than 2, it would say x is less than or equal to two, because the equal is also a way to sort of fail to make it true, right? If it's supposed to be less than two, greater than two, and it were equal to two, that's one way to fail. If it's less than two, that's the other way to fail. Yep. Um, I'm actually going back up to five. Sure. I just want to make sure that I don't get it wrong when we do homework or something. Yep. If it was all books are longer than this book, what would the negation? Okay. So if the statement said all books are longer than this book. Let's actually jot that down at the bottom here so that you have that as another example. So let's say we had an example that said all books are longer than this book. So the first thing that you would do is you would work with that word all. So if it starts out with all or no, right? You know, those, those strong, those universal quantifiers, what would we change it to? Some or there exists. We'll use the word some since that's the one I heard. So instead of all books, we have some books. And now what would it say? So all books are longer than this book. So some books are not. Some books are not longer. Than this book. Would it be wrong to say some books are shorter than this book? Um, it would because equal to is still an option. Uh, it's the same problem that we run into with the inequalities. So we do want to change it as little as possible by using the word not, but not by changing the actual gram like descriptive phrase. Because equal to is usually an option when we're describing the comparisons. Yep. Okay, good question. Anything else on this slide? Essentially, it's saying, as in, B is less than or equal to. 
Yeah, it's almost like, I'll change colors to specify, but it's almost like this one's saying that um, we've got uh, A is greater than B, and now this is saying A is less than or equal to B. That means not longer. Or in a very real okay. sense, it's like saying not greater. Mm -hmm. gotcha. Yeah. Okay, that's... Yeah. Cool. All right. So we're going to look at a table, and there's something that's sort of missing from this table, but it also kind of doesn't go in the table. So I'm going to write it as a line afterwards. <clears throat> I mentioned there were three connective phrases that really encompass all the rest. Do you remember what they were? Um, flip back if you don't remember. And Yes. And... Or, and if then. And the additional one that we're going to put sort of under the table, because it's related to these ideas, is the word not. That negation stuff we just did. So all of these have a symbol that represents them. And all of them have their sort of their name, what they're describing, the type of statement they create. So do you remember back in Venn diagrams when we did the set theory, we had things called unions and intersections, right? And complements. These are the same ideas. It's just that instead of being related to sets, now they're related to statements. Okay, so the first one, the word and, when we did set theory, those were the intersections. Yes? So these are actually called conjunctions. And when we did set theory, the word and created an upside down U. Remember that as well. And these symbol will be an upside down V. Um, sort of as a remembrance, some people like to think of that, hey, it looks kind of like a capital A without the line in the middle, A for and. Or it looks like a capital N, but only half of the N for N, the N and and. Okay, so whatever it takes. So this is our connective um, symbol for the word and. Now, the word or was related to union, yeah? This one is actually called a disjunction. And instead of a U, right, for union that we had before, it actually looks like a B. I don't have any clever mnemonics for this one. But a U opens upward and so does a V. So the way that the symbol opens matches set theory, okay? The intersections open down, the unions open up. If then, it's called a conditional. And we'll be looking at all of these in more depth as we continue in chapter three. And it's represented with an arrow. Okay, so we're gonna have an arrow when we have that. And the one not, the reason I've got not sort of not in this box is because it's really not creating a, common sta a compound statement. But it does have a name, and it does have a symbol, so sort of the way these are being described is quite similar. Um, the word not is what was creating our negations. So this is a negation. And it has a symbol, and its symbol is a tilde. So when we did complements, we did the bars on the top, right, of the, um, of the objects, the sets that we were working with. This one will actually be a tilde, and it will be located in front of what it's referring to. So we can actually see one down here on number seven as an example. You see the tilde in front of the P. Okay. So if you have printed out notes, yours probably don't match mine because I made a typo on something. Um, and depending on when you printed it depends on the typo I've made because I tried to fix it and I fixed it wrong. So this one should say that Leah is a teenager and it should say Joe is a lawyer. So if you just change it to say Leah and Joe, that'd be great. Make sure those actually show up. All right, so what we're going to do on the next two examples is we're going to work at taking symbols and putting them in words, and then taking words and putting them in symbols. <coughs> um, you might feel kind of like, well, what's the point of the symbols? I mean, can't we just work all in words? We're going to need the symbols for some things we're going to be doing later, and they're going to make things a lot easier by having them. So we're working on just transferring um, the two between each other. So our statement here is given to us in symbols. We have a tilde P. We have this upside down V and we have a tilde Q and we're going to read the statement from left to right and then we're going to write it down in words from left to right. So the statement P itself is what? She is a teenager. 
Yeah, Leah is a teenager. That's the one I changed for her so I'd have a name. Leah is a teenager, okay? If I put a tilde in front of it, I'm supposed to create the negation. So what's the negation for Leah is a teenager? Yeah, Leah is not a teenager. So we're going to start with that statement. Leah is not a teenager. Okay, so we've done this piece. Now we have our upside down V connective. What in the world does that one represent? And. So we're going to write and. So we've done that part now. And then our last part is tilde Q. Q is the statement, Joe is a lawyer. So what is tilde Q? Joe is not a lawyer. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so we're gonna do the same thing now, but backwards. We're gonna start with the words and we're gonna create the symbols. So, same, same phrasing at the beginning. That's why I wanted them to match. Leah is a teenager, Joe is a lawyer. I think yours matches that even if you've printed it out. And we're going to take the statement, Leah is not a teenager or Joe is not a lawyer. So how would I do the symbols for Leah is not a teenager? Um, this says Joe is a lawyer. Yeah, did I just say it wrong out loud? You said Joe is not a lawyer. I'm sorry. I may, I'm sorry. did not mean to say that. Yes, it should say what it is on the paper. Joe is a lawyer. Sorry about that. Okay. How do I do the symbol for Leah is not a teenager? The squiggly and the P. Okay, so we call it a tilde. The tilde P. So we've taken care of this first piece. Then I've got the word or. That's a V. And then I have Joe is a lawyer. Q. Q. Okay, that's, that's just what it is. You're just moving back and forth between the two. Any questions on that? Okay, the next example is the one place today, especially um, that I mentioned earlier on, where we, we are going to sort of hearken back to something we've talked about before. But it's something you've seen sort of historically in your academic career before now anyway. Um, it's uh, the idea of this, the real numbers, the rational numbers, the whole numbers, all the stuff we did, and we did a diagram for them. Let me just remind you basically what the diagram looked like so that we can make sure that we're thinking of the right things. We had a diagram like this. Had a bunch of embedded square rectangle shapes inside of here like this. Um, these were the irrational numbers. These were our rational numbers. <coughs> the whole picture are called our real numbers. And then I'm gonna abbreviate symbols inside because I'm running out of space. These were the natural numbers, that's the counting ones, one, two, three, four, and so forth. Then we expanded to include the zero in the whole numbers. And then we expanded to include the negatives in our integers. So this was the diagram that we had um, that this would be potentially helpful as you think about these particular problems. So we're going to decide if the statement, including the quantifier, is going to be a true or a false statement. So the first statement, number nine, says all irrational numbers are real numbers. So in my diagram, the irrational ones are right here. Are those numbers all real? Yes. Yes, right? The entire diagram is real numbers and it's just a sliver of the diagram visually. Yes, that's a true statement. Number 10 says each whole number is a positive number. Okay, so Bren, you said that really fast. Why is it false? Because negative is inside a whole. Okay, negative is not inside a whole. So is it true? Yes. Are you sure? I don't know. It is false. So let me go with that. You're right. It is false. But in order to say it's false, you need to know why. So Bryn gave us a, a thought, and that one wasn't quite it. Is zero not a positive number? Ooh. So Seth, you hit on the exact counter. It's called a counter example. The number zero doesn't work here. Zero is a whole number. Okay, so let me remind you how the picture works. The natural numbers are inside of the whole numbers are inside of the, the integers. So the negatives don't occur until we have this outside piece that's got the Z. 
So that's why the negatives aren't a good example. But whole numbers, while they include all the positive natural numbers, like one, two, three, four, the counting numbers, they also include, like Seth mentioned, or somebody mentioned, the number zero, right? The number zero, I think it was you, Seth. The number zero right here, okay? So the number zero is not positive or negative. It's neither. So the fact that we can sort of throw the number zero here, all I need, remember, all I need for the statement to be false is one number that fails. And that's exactly what I have here is one number failing to make the statement true. Does that make sense? All right. <clears throat>